All right. Um, so we didn't quite get to these last two slides, so I just want to go over them real quick. And remember that the, the stuff we were when we were getting talking about resonance, uh, and I said really the point that I want you to remember is that the size of things and the size of the sound impact each other, right? In in interesting ways, uh, and this is another example of that. So. Uh, Remember I told you the first day you can't hide from sound, right? Uh, it's, you, you can't dodge it. <laughs> it's this wave that's pushing and pulling at you and you can't duck it. Uh, you can, however, attempt to block it. And, uh, but if you're trying to block it, your ability to block it has to do with this relationship of the size of the thing and the size of the sound. So. Uh, if you try to put an obstacle in the way of a, of a sound wave and, and you're trying to actually use that to block and, and impede the propagation of the sound, that obstacle needs to be larger than the wavelength of the sound you are trying to stop. Because if it's not, the sound will just go around it. If it's, a, if it's a, an object that is smaller than the wavelength of the sound, then it become, it's basically what's called acoustically transparent. The sound doesn't see it, okay? It just goes around it. Um, and if, assuming that the obstacle, even if it's large, assuming that it's not infinite, not infinitely large, eventually the sound will get around it because uh, that energy has to go somewhere. So it will get around it, but it'll just, uh, so like this, this area in the top here, you can see that we've got a large obstacle and the, the energy is sort of bending around, but there is this kind of shadow barrier here. And there are various manifestations of this shadow, depending on you know, the geometry of the situation. But, uh, but it does create a shadow. Now, the, a, a good example of, of applying this in real life is uh, if you ever notice on the freeway, like the interstates, and they, they build up on the side of the road, you know, kind of like a, a, a dirt kind of hill. And then at the top of the hill, they have this kind of like 10 foot wall, it's like a concrete wall or a, a stone wall. Uh, what they're trying to do there is this. They're trying to diffract the sound for the people who have houses right there on the side of the, of the interstate, OK? It's, they can't stop all that sound. Like, it's going to get over that wall. But the wall is large enough that it creates a shadow. So if your house is right here, <laughs> Uh, yes, all that energy will eventually get around it. By the time it does, it's past your house. Okay? And as we'll learn uh, on Friday and next week, uh, by the time it does get around here, it's traveled some distance and it's lost a little bit of its energy. So it's not quite as loud that way. Um, so that's sort of interesting. But now this barrier is very small and the sound is just wrapping right around it and it's like it's not even there. So. The thing that I want you guys to remember about this is that you know, sound views obstacles differently than we do. Okay? When we look at something, um, oh, I lost my old visual aid but, um, to one of our cleanup things. Let's see. Well, okay, we can use, we use the back of this chair. So if you were to if you were to look at the back of this chair and describe its properties, how would you describe it as a human being? Mesh. Mesh. Porous. What do you mean by porous? It's got holes in, it's got holes in it. Perforated. Yeah. Okay. That's natural. Most most people look at something like this and say, yeah, it's got a bunch of holes. Okay. Sound, however, looks at it differently. Sound does not see a, a surface with a bunch of holes. Sound sees a surface with a bunch of little obstructions. Okay, so sound is interested in the space between the holes, not the holes themselves. Okay, uh, and that's the important thing to understand. Uh, it's not a, if you're trying to uh, let the sound get through. So let's say, for example, you're tr trying to hide a speaker in a set somewhere or something because uh, nobody wants to see it, but you still have to be able to hear it. Well, you know, you'll say, well, we can put punch some holes in this wall and then the sound will get out. And, and yes, you will need to punch holes, but it's not about the holes. Okay? What it is about is the size of the obstructions. The holes can be any size you want, but 
the space between them <laughs> needs to be small enough that such that the sound you're trying to let out will go around it, okay? The holes could be teeny tiny or they could be really big. It doesn't really matter. If, if, but if, they're really, if the holes are really big and there's still two feet of space between them, between each hole, then you know, nothing above 1K is going to really want to get through there very easily, okay? So uh, the size of that, of the space between the holes, uh, if you imagine, let's, you know, the, the, what's, what's the approximate wavelength of 4 kilohertz? About three inches, right? Yeah. So it's about three inches. So if you wanted to let four kilohertz through, you would need to have obstructions that are smaller than three inches. So it'd be more than three inches apart from the holes, right? Make sense? Yeah. Uh, okay. So that's the that's the first thing I want you to to kind of look at. Next thing is uh, wind and temperature gradients. Okay. Um, so remember I said at the beginning that temperature and humidity and things like this affect the way sound propagates? I never really talked about what that is, but uh, sound travels faster in warm air than it does in cold air. Uh, and, you know, th that's just a thing. So the speed of sound is kind of a moving target depending on temperature. As, as it gets colder, the sound will slow down, okay? Uh, and there are some situations where your sound can actually be traveling through what's called a temperature gradient, where there are parts of the, of the air that is one temperature and other parts of the air that are another temperature. One example of this could be if you're ever doing outdoors, sound outdoors, okay? And maybe you're rehearsing during the day and the sun is beating down on you and the, it's warming up the ground and all of this. And then what happens at sunset um, when you, start your show, <laughs> okay? Well, the air starts cooling down, right? But the ground is still warm. And you get this temperature gradient where you've got warm air down here and cold air up there. And as you get a sound that starts propagating through there, this wave is gonna move faster uh, down towards the ground and slower up in the air. And that has the effect of, of diffracting the wave upwards. Okay, the energy collects up there where the cool air is because it's, the sound travels sl slower there. Okay, uh, and that's gonna, what the, the net result of that is it's gonna sound a little bit different now down there on the ground than it did earlier in the day because a lot of your energy is sort of bending up towards the, the sky. Uh, you're going to lose some high frequency. It's going to feel, sound a little bit quieter. Um, and there's not a whole lot that you can do about that. You just have to kind of wait for the temperature to kind of even out a little bit. Uh, you know, you could potentially, you know, move your speakers up higher and point them down or something in a little bit, but you're not going to do that at the start of your show. So you just you just have to deal with that. Now, if it's the other way around, you got cold air at the bottom and warm air on top, then it kind of ends up kind of tripping over itself, right? So remember, it, it, the, it naturally wants to dri drift towards the cool air. So you got all this energy kind of building up down to the ground where it's cool, and it just sort of bounces off of that, finds the warm air, goes fast, and then... And, and, and so you end up kind of with these um, loud spots and not so loud spots and loud spots and not so loud spots. So your even coverage gets like thrown out the window. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so is there a, I mean, like, obviously it's, it's super, su not subjective, it's super different based on the situation, mm -hmm. the exact variables, but is usually the area where the cool air is and the warm air isn't notably above the heads of people? Like it's saying it's like a sitting space, just grass concert. I mean, so distance is, is really the biggest variable you have to think about here. Um, it takes a lot of distance for this kind of effect to manifest itself. Um, so this is why I say it primarily happens outdoors. Um, and yeah, it depends. It really depends on, on how dramatic the temperature gradient is. And is, so. that, is that distance enough to warrant having something like, would, like having a second set of speakers that are operating as delays? To sure. Like, 
would that be able to offset this because they're coming from a new well, source? Well, it could, but only temporarily. Because remember, this is a problem of it. Of it this is a temp. The thing, what's causing the and problem is a temperature back. problem, and that temperature problem is temporary. Got okay, on. eventually that ground's going to cool off. So it's all, it's almost like there's you can't fix it because then you'll have a different problem permanently when it yeah. goes away. Another example of this is in, indoors in the theater. So. You, you, we've all, you know, we've all been in a tech rehearsal for a show, right? Mm -hmm. um, what do you notice temperature-wise during tech inside the theater? It's usually freezing. It's usually freezing during tech, right? You're always like bundling up and everything. Why? Because theaters have massive air conditioners in them, right? Huge, enormous air conditioners designed to to keep hundreds of people cool all at the same time. Okay. Well, in tech, there's like 10 people in the room. Okay, so you've got this thing that's trying to cool off hundreds of people, and there's only ten people there, and so those ten people are freezing. Okay, and remember, sound travels slower in cool air, right? <laughs> and then the first time you like fill the room with people, like a preview or opening night or something, it suddenly sounds a lot different, right? You ever notice that? It sounds a heck of a lot different opening night when you fill the room full of people. A lot of people say, "Well, the people are absorbing all the sound," and it's like, "Well, they are a little bit maybe, but..." That wouldn't, you know, all absorb uh, people absorbing sound would just af affect how much sound is bouncing off the floor, but it shouldn't affect. It has no effect on the direct sound from the loudspeaker to the ear, right? Um, so yes, there's a little bit of absorption going on there, but but that can't be the whole problem. Uh, what what I th suspect, strongly suspect, is is really going on that's more important is a temperature gradient, because. But the, the air conditioning is usually in the ceiling, right? And suddenly you flood the floor with big hot water bottles, <laughs> right? That are 99 degrees. <laughs> Hundreds of, of, of human-sized 98 degrees hot water bottles, okay? And that ground gets very hot very, very quickly, okay? Like within 10 minutes, whew, all these people rush in, and suddenly it's very hot down there. And the air conditioner kicks on, so it's very cool up in the air as the air is like trying to compensate. And for the first 30 minutes or so, you've got a massive temperature gradient. You've got really hot air down at the seats and really cold air up in the ceiling. And what's going to happen to that sound? It's going to go up, right? It's going to drift up towards the sky, and you're going to lose. You're going to experience a high frequency attenuation. Everything's going to sound a little quieter for a little while, uh, and you're going to freak out. Right, and you can think, oh, everything's quieter. I gotta like turn stuff up and go and fix all my cues in QLab and all this kind of stuff. But if you stop and listen for a minute, and just wait until about halfway through the first act, you'll notice that things settle down a little bit. That's right? also why, like every single show I've ever done at Triad, they're like, you need to turn up the, the pre-show music. It's too quiet. And it's like, no, there's just like a crap ton of. Well, that's that's a slightly different problem because that's really a noise floor problem, well, no, right? Even just when, like, yeah, they're waiting for anything. So you can compensate for that a little bit, right? You could say, well, the first few sh cues of the show, maybe I'll run them a little bit hotter because I'm always going to have that weird temperature thing. But you certainly don't want to go and just make some global change to your sound system just to solve this thing that's really only going to be a 20 or 30 minute problem. Eventually, that temperature is going to even out a little bit, and and you want the problem won't be quite so dramatic. Okay, so. And, I, and, I, and again, this is less noticeable in small rooms. Like it, bigger rooms is when you really see this problem because it just you know you need some space for this kind of diffraction to happen. And is it so? Is it that the sound like when it's doing this? Mm -hmm. Is it what is what is it doing? Like is it trying to get to the warm air but being sucked up into it? No, it's just that it it's it it gets less resistance in the in the warm air. Right, so it's moving faster, but the but it's an entire wave front. So you've got your your speaker here, right, and it's outputting sound everywhere, mm -hmm. right. But if there's warm air down here and cool air up here, this cool air is not going to go as far. So a certain amount of time has passed, and the cool air has only traveled that far, but the warm air has traveled that far, right. So there's a there's a it's down here it's been able to travel a little bit farther. Up here, it's only maybe gotten a foot, right? <laughs> yeah. And then it does it again and, and again. Now, if you were to take a line through the center of this, the propagation of the sound is actually feels like it's going up because 
you know, all of this energy up here is just collecting up there because it's meeting so much resistance. It's not being allowed to move as far, okay? And so this is why I say it takes some distance for this to fully manifest because you have to kind of wait until you've gone a little ways and you realize that, you know, everything's collecting up in the, at the, up in the ceiling because it can't move as well up there, so it's getting trapped. And so it's, it, it has the effect of everything kind of drifting up. Uh, and, but in reality, what is happening is just down at the floor, it's moving faster than it is up in the air, okay? But the net result is, is it appears as though the sound is drifting upwards, okay? okay? So if all, your, if all your energy is, is up in the, in the ceiling, it's not down in the ears, where the ears are, right? So it just sounds a little bit quieter. And this is primarily noticed at the high frequencies, not the low frequencies. So everything sounds quieter, but it also sounds a little duller because you don't have that, those high frequencies to clear things up. So the same thing happens in wind. So, um, and this is kind of, you would, if you think about this for a minute, it makes sense, right? If, if sound is, is manipulating air and the air is already moving, then the way the air is moving would affect the way the sound moves. So if the sound is pushing against a breeze, so there's a breeze pointed towards your loudspeakers, well, there's that, that breeze is gonna pose some resistance to your sound propagating. So, uh, you know, if the, if, Here's your sound source right here, and, and if your, your wind is blowing this direction, then the sound going against the wind is going to drift up. The sound going with the wind, that's going to get some help, right? The wind's going to help it. It's going to move a little bit faster, and it's going to kind of, it's going to drift closer, more towards the ground, okay? Um, you find this mostly outdoors again. particularly like in places like where you do shows at the beach, for example. There's always this breeze coming in off the ocean. So if your show is facing the ocean, all your sound's gonna drift up. So you might wanna tip your speakers down a little bit. Or if it's the other way and the ocean's behind you, you, know, you may wanna uh, tip your speakers up a little bit because the wind's gonna catch it and, and push it down towards the people, okay? All right. I am, I'm confident there are, there's math you can use pr to predict all of this, but it's that, I've never found that necessary. <laughs> so I've never bothered to figure that out. Okay, so uh, let's go through the homework now, shall we? So if you, th those, we didn't get to those slides, but there were a couple of questions on here related to those slides, so hopefully you managed to look that up. Um, if not, maybe you wrote it down just as I was saying it just now. Uh, if not, we'll go through it right now. Okay, so let's just go through these one at a time. And if you have questions, we'll clarify, okay? So these first ones are pretty easy. Formula used to find frequency if you know the wavelength. Okay, so I wanna know frequency. So frequency, oops. So frequency equals speed of sound, which is C divided by wavelength. Is that what everybody got? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Oh, yes. Sorry, take I a red. Wanna. Yes, take a red pencil. If I have an orange sharpie, will this work? No, red pencil. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. I need to look at these and know which things you made today and which things you made before. Okay. Okay. If I want to know wavelength, that would be wavelength equals speed of sound divided by frequency. Yeah. Approximate speed of sound when, when we're doing rough calculations in our head. 1,000 feet per second. Does that sound right? Okay. So this is the easy stuff. We'll get to the hard stuff here. Okay, so here's the one that we just discussed. What happens to sound when it's directed at an object that is substantially larger than its wavelength? It goes over? Yeah, it's, it's, it's partially impeded, right? It, it, it's, it, it gets slowed yeah, down a little like bit. Like it actually does something. Yeah, versus yeah it's, something. Di it's diffracted. You could say it's diffracted. You could say it's blocked a little bit. It slows down, it's whatever. But the object impedes the progress of that wave, right, if, if the object is larger. Um, and what about when it's directed at an object that's substantially smaller than its wavelength? 
Yeah, so nothing really happens, right? It's essentially invisible. It just goes right around it like it's not even there. How's the speed of sound affected by air temperature? Yeah, so it speeds up in warm air, slows down in cool air. We did, this was a few years ago during Intensive Arts. Uh, there was this old theater, movie theater or something that in Boone, North Carolina, and they asked us to come over as kind of a workshop to, they were gonna renovate it, and they wanted us to do a little acoustic analysis of it and kind of give them some suggestions on, you know, putting walls up and all that to kind of help things. And uh, we, it was freezing, it was December, it was a snowstorm that day, it was, it was quite literally freezing. And of course it was an empty old building that didn't have any you know, heating in there, so we were, we, we were just all bundled up and we're doing all these measurements. And none of our measurements were making any sense. Like we were measuring you know, reflections and things of the sound, and, and it was like, none of this is making any sense. Like it seemed like all the measurements that we were looking at on the computer screen seemed like they were things that were happening in a much larger room than we were in. And so this does not make any sense. Why is this room seemingly breaking the laws of physics? <laughs> because this, and the answer we finally realized a few hours later was, it's just so freaking cold here that sound is traveling slower, <laughs> substantially slower. So none of our reflections make any sense because we're trying to figure out Oh, okay, so it, there's a reflection here that's arriving 100 milliseconds later, and we're trying to figure out what is the, the geometric path of that reflection in this room, and we couldn't find it, because the only possible uh, surface that the sound could be reflecting in was in the room, was in the building next door, <laughs> right? Because it was so far away, and it was just because sound was traveling slower, because it was so cold. So it was getting the walls that were very close to us, it was just bouncing off those much later than we would expect. For that within the software that you're using, can you like jet set the temperature? Not really. Sound? We so couldn't. We not. To... We couldn't figure out how to. So we just kind of. Set, we we just kind of fudged it in our brain. We said, well, we measured it and said, well, and just with the tape measure and figured out what was going on. I have a question. Yeah. When you were drawing, uh, when we were talking about the temperature and and all that, mm -hmm. why? So what is the significance of like? the fact that like the sound was here and then it went down? Is it uh -huh. because it's just like traveling really slow and then like eventually dies off to the point where nobody hears well, it? Well, no, it's the opposite thing of, of it drifting up. So if it's, wa if it's warm in, in, in the air and cool down in the ground, then uh, it's traveling very, very fast up in the air, but very, very slow down at the ground. And so all that energy is collecting down at the, at the ground because it's being slowed down there. It's not being allowed to move so, quite so much, okay? So it moves really fast up here and really slow down there, and so the whole wavefront is kind of falling over. Okay. Okay. Um, this I, I see this a lot with my toddler, <laughs> who's he, not so much now. He's much better at walking, but you know you see this with kids sometimes when they first start walking. It's like you know their heads are heavier than their feet can move. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> and they they start moving and they just like fall over. Okay, that's actually <laughs> right. Really good. Because their head is so darn heavy and moves so fast, but they cannot move their feet as fast, and they just fall over. That's what happens to your sound, right? Because, you know, th th at the bottom, it's, it's very, very cold, <laughs> and so the sound can't move quite so fast, but up in the air, it's moving really, really fast, okay? okay? That, so it, it does. It's the same thing happens to your sound wave. It just kind of <laughs> falls over, okay? Uh, okay, now we get to some good stuff. What's the wavelength of a 500 hertz sine wave? And we're, in, we're doing this in our head at the moment, so uh, this would be 1,000 feet per second divided by 500 hertz would give us what? Two feet. Yeah? Everybody get that? Let's see what we got next. So what frequency would have a wavelength of five feet? That would be 1,000 feet per second divided by five feet. We get what? Should be 200 hertz. I agree. Okay. What delay applied to one of two 100 hertz sine waves would make it 90 degrees out of phase with the other? So uh, first thing we, we need to know is the wavelength of 100 hertz. 
So that would be 1,000 feet per second divided by 100. And we get what? 10 feet. 10 feet. So it's, we're looking at 10 feet. Uh, so 90 degrees out of phase would be there, right? And if this whole thing is 10 feet, then that would be 5 feet, right? This would be 10 feet, 0 feet. This would be what? 2.5 feet, aka 2.5 milliseconds, because it's about one foot per millisecond. So it, I would say 2.5 milliseconds. Everybody get that? No, and I don't understand how you, I mean, I, I watched what you did and like it kind of makes sense, but I don't. Okay, so remember, time and distance are connected in uh -huh. sound, okay? And I'm asking for delay. What okay. delay would you need to apply to something? Yes? One foot per millisecond. Or if you're doing it with a calculator, 1.13 feet per millisecond. Okay? So uh, if I want to find out the delay, I first need to find out how much distance would I have traveled to get to 90 degrees. Okay? okay? And 90 degrees is right here, right? Because it's a circle, zero degrees, 360 degrees. It ends up back where it started. Okay. okay. Halfway through would be 180. Okay. 180 degrees, right? Okay. You understand yeah. why? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I, I just so, wouldn't have thought of that. Anymore. Right. So you got zero degrees, and it comes back 360. Half of that is 180. 90 degrees, 270 degrees. Okay. Okay. In a circle. You just unwrap that into a wave, and it's the same thing, right? It ends up the same place it starts, so it's like a circle. So we got 0 degrees, 360, 180, and therefore that would be your 90, and this would be your 270. Okay, so I'm asking, there's your 90 degrees, and I want to know how long it takes to do that. What is the delay? What is the time it takes to do that? Well, we know that we have a 10-foot wavelength here, mm -hmm. okay, because it's 100 hertz, and we calculate that. So. At, so we're saying 90 degrees is one-fourth of that full cycle, right? We've only traveled one-fourth of the whole distance. So one-fourth of that distance of 10 feet is two and a half feet. And it's one foot per millisecond, and therefore two and a half feet is two and a half milliseconds. There's your delay. So let's try another one right here. This is the same scenario. Same 100 hertz wave, okay? So now we're talking, here's 0 degrees, 360, there's 180, there's 90, it means 270 would be here. That's three, I've gone 3 fourths of the full wave, right? And if it's 10 feet, what's, what's 3 fourths of that 10 foot wave? 7.5. Yeah, 7.5, right? So, because it'd be 5 here at 180. So we've got 0, we've got 2.5 feet, we've got 5 feet, and over here is 10 feet. Halfway between there would be 7.5. 7.5 feet would be the 270. And if it's 1 foot per millisecond, then we have 7.5 milliseconds of delay. There you go. Okay. If I combine two sine waves of equal amplitude and frequency that were 180 degrees out of phase with each other, what would be the result? Silence. Yeah. Or, or a better word would be cancellation. All right? But yes. You know, I, I, the reason I say silence is that silence implies that we would hear it in the first place, right? And it could be that it's audio that's happening inside the computer or something. And, and so I, I, I just, uh, just to clarify that we're not necessarily always talking about sound waves in the air. Sometimes we're talking about audio waves inside of a computer or happening on a cable or inside of an amplifier, right? So there are various forms that these waves can take. So uh, keeping that in mind that if we just look at the wave itself independent of the medium, uh, whether it's you know air or electricity or whatever, uh, what would really happen is the two things would cancel out. 
But yes, I would accept silence as an answer. Okay. Uh, what is the lowest resonant frequency of a six inch pipe that is closed at one end? Okay. So we have this pipe closed at one end, and it is six inches, aka 0 0.5 feet. We have to do that because we only know how to do this in feet. We haven't learned how to do it in uh, any other unit of measurement. Uh, okay, so there's some magic frequency that's going to resonate in here. That frequency is going to have a wavelength that is how big? Well, it's going to be four times as big as this pipe. We know that much at least, right? Because it's closed at one end. And the lowest resonant frequency of a pipe closed in one end has a wavelength that is four times as long as the pipe. So if the pipe is half a foot, what length would be four times that big? Yeah, two feet, right? So 0.5 times four is two. So two foot wavelength, well now we know that, we can figure out a frequency from there, right? So this would be 1,000 feet per second divided by two feet. And we get what? 500 hertz. Okay. What would be the lowest resonant frequency of a hallway closed at both ends? That was 10 feet long. We're basically talking about a pipe that's closed at both ends, right? So it's a little old box. And that box is 10 feet long. So there's going to be some frequency that will naturally fit in there. Lots of frequencies, actually. But the lowest frequency that would naturally fit in there is going to have a wavelength. Forget about the 10 feet for a moment. How big is that, wave, how big is that wavelength going to be for that kind of space? Twice as big, right? So whatever the length of the, of the, of the hallway is, that frequency that resonates is going to have a wavelength that is twice that long. And that's just one of those things you've got to memorize. Okay? So yes, if, if that's 10 feet, then the wavelength is going to equal 20 feet of, for that lowest resonant frequency. So we know that. We know a wavelength. We can figure out a frequency from a wavelength. That would be 1,000 feet per second divided by 20. That would give us 50, right? 50 hertz, a pretty low frequency. Yeah? You got that? OK, how are we doing? We're done with page two. What? OK, using our rough approximation for speed of sound, how far will sound travel in 76 milliseconds? 76 feet, because in our, in our head, it's one foot per millisecond, right? So yeah, 76 feet. How long will it take for sound to travel 38 feet? 38 milliseconds. What would that be in seconds? Yeah, no, it would just be 038. OK, I just want to drive that home. Because we will, you'll be doing that kind of conversion a lot between feet and milliseconds and milliseconds to seconds and vice versa. So just kind of, yeah, when we're doing it in our head. When we're doing it with the calculator, it, it's 1.13 feet for every millisecond. And we'll do a few of these of those in a minute here, OK? <coughs> All right. Uh, 38 milliseconds, or 0 0.038 feet. OK, so now we're going to break out the calculators and do this, do this a little bit more specifically. What is the lowest resonant frequency of a tube closed at one end that is 8 inches deep? OK, so 8 inches, or something like that. Uh, all right. We don't know how to do this in inches, do we? We've got to make this feet. So how, what is, how many feet is 8 inches? 0.667. How do we figure that out? 8 divided by 12. Yeah, so we could do 8 divided by 12. Now, just to walk, let's just walk through that for a moment. Uh, we know that there is 12 inches in every one foot. We know this, right? We learned that in elementary school. 
So uh, if we wanted to find out how many feet are in an inch, we could take that one foot and divide it by 12. So just divide one foot into 12 parts, and we will get a number that represents feet or inches that in a foot, right? So our feet in an inches. So once one divided by 12, anybody do that math? 0.083. Okay, so one inch equals 0 0.083 feet. Okay, we've just now proven that mathematically. One inch equals 0 0.083 feet. And I said we have eight inches. Yes? So if eight inches is, or if one inch is 0 0.083 feet, then eight inches would be 0 0.083 times eight, right? So times eight equals what? 0 0.083 times eight. Anybody? Anybody? I gotta break out my calculator. Point or. 0 0.683 times 8, yeah, 0.664, okay? There we go. So that's, that's the long form way of g going from inches to feet, okay? However, we got, one, we got the distance of one inch by just taking one foot divided by 12. So really, we could do the same thing by just dividing anything by 12, right? So if we just take our eight inches, oops, eight inches divided by 12, ah, eight divided by 12, and we get pretty close to the same thing, okay? The difference is rounding here now. Yeah, it's, just, so it's just rounding errors at this point. Well, this is, so this is feet. So this is how many feet is eight inches. Right. So the point is, I don't know how to figure out a frequency using inches. So no, I have no, to. I get that. What do you do with all these sixes and the seven? I don't worry about them. I just stick them in my memory. Okay. <laughs> and say, well, I don't, that's a long number. I don't want to remember it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the other way, the other way is you could just round it right to point. Six, six, seven, or six, seven, or whatever, and you'd get pretty darn close. And we were at, you know, when we did it the long way, we got what, 0. 0.6, six, six, four. Six, six, four, which, you know, the, there's gonna, so there will be a slight difference in the answer if we do it that way. But remember, the, the test here is could I hear the difference between my answer and your answer? And in that case, no, we would not hear the difference, even though the number would technically be different. Okay? So uh, there we go, I've got that. So now I've got the actual wavelength of. Well, I've got the actual length of the pipe right now, which is, if I bring that back up here, 0.667. So the actual wavelength of whatever this frequency is is going to be longer than that. It's going to be bigger than the pipe itself, right? It always is. So how much bigger in this case? Four times. Four times, because it's a pipe that's capped at one end but open at the other end. So, I'm going to, so what am I going to do with this number, Taylor? I'm going to first multiply it by four, OK? So times four. And that gives me the wavelength now of this fundamental resonant frequency, which is 2.66667. And I'm going to now put that in my memory instead. Okay. Uh, and now I can do some math on this. So if I want to find out what frequency that is, it's speed of sound divided by the wavelength. So 1,130, because we're dealing with the calculator now, so we're going to be slightly more specific about our speed of sound. 1,130 feet per second divided by whatever that number was that I didn't want to remember, which is 2.66666667, equals 423.75 of what? Hertz. Did anybody get anything close to that? No. Yeah. What, what did you get? A bunch of bull crap because I'm okay. stupid. It's fine. I... As long as, you know, if your answer was, you know, 420. I was on, I was on the right track, yeah. but I was missing some key elements. So if your answer was 423 hertz, give or take 20 or so, you got it right. Okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's try this next one. 
Okay, so what frequency would you get if you filled the, that little tube with water halfway? Well, you know, forget about the water for a moment and just all we're really doing is making the tube half as long, right? So now it's only four inches, right? So we could do all that same math and figure all that out, but in reality, all I really need to do is go back to my wavelength, which was 0.267. I just need to divide that by two, right? Because it's smaller now. So I can divide that by two. I get 1.3333333 now. I'll put that on my memory instead. And now I'll take 1,130 feet per second divided by that number in memory. And now I'm at 847 and a half hertz. Now, the other, you could walk it back all the way to the beginning, say, OK, now it's four inches. You could figure out how many feet is four inches. You could multiply that by four. You could take 1,130 feet. 30 feet per second, divide it by whatever that number was, and you would still get around 847 and a half hertz. Okay. So the shortcut was just that, well, I've already done half this math. I'll just go back to that number and divide it by two, and I'll be good to go. So if you got something in the range of 847 hertz, give or take 20 or so, you got it right. Okay. All right. Next, lowest resonant frequency of a hallway closed at both ends that is 17 feet in length. OK, it's just this, we're doing the same problem over and over again here. Uh, this time, it's closed at both ends, and it's 17 feet, right? 17 feet closed at both ends. The wavelength is going to be how much larger than that? Two Twice. OK, so what is 2 times 17? times 2 equals 34 feet for wavelength. OK, so now all we've got to do is convert the wavelength into a frequency. And that is 1,130 feet per second divided by 34 feet. And we get what? Let's see if that's what I got. 1,130 divided by 34. Yeah, 33.24 hertz. OK, so if you got 33.24, give or take a little. So the higher we get in frequency, the give or take gets bigger, right? <laughs> uh, just because that's the way it works. Uh, the, the, the range of tolerance between can I hear the difference, that, that, that tolerance is less at lower frequencies than it is at higher frequencies. Um, OK, next thing. This is, I'm, I'm throwing you a, a slight curveball here, which is if I heard a resonance at 550 hertz in a theater, what's, what size of enclosed resonance space should I be looking for to figure that out? So you, you've created a standing wave. Remember when we did that in class the other day? And you're trying to figure out, well, what part of this room is causing this standing wave? Well, what you're looking for is two parallel walls that are a distance apart that is sympathetic to 550 hertz. So the first to figure this out, I would need to first know the wavelength of 550 hertz. OK? And that we would figure that out by saying 1,130 feet per second divided by 550. What does that equal? Two point one. 2.1? OK, 2.1 what? Feet, right? Yes. OK, so that's the wavelength of 550 hertz. Uh, what's that? I get 2.0454. Same thing. OK, uh, all right, so now, uh, we're looking, we're, now we're looking for two parallel walls that would cause a frequency of that wavelength to resonate. Well, how far apart are those walls going to be relative to that wavelength? They're going to be the same, or are they going to be different? It's going to be smaller, right? Smaller by half. Because it's just like if you know when you got a pipe that's closed at one end, that's two parallel walls, and that resonant frequency has a wavelength that is twice as long as yeah. that distance. You say closed at one end. Or both ends. Oh, we're talking two parallel walls, wall wall, closed at both ends, right? So yes, 
We are looking for a space that is half as long as that. That would make 550 hertz sing, right? So we're just going to take that, divide it by 2. And we should get what? 1.05 feet, right? This is not entirely practical. It's unlikely that you have two parallel walls that are one foot apart. But, but in theory, this is what would happen. <coughs> Sure. Added, yeah. But how, how would that actually so the, 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 the space? So the best way that this would apply is, you know, you put your speaker in, again, you're putting the speaker inside the set, right? And it's sitting inside of a box <laughs> that is a foot wide. And you're thinking, why is 500 hertz so loud suddenly from this speaker? It didn't sound like that before until I put it inside the set. And now it sounds, now 500 hertz is suddenly a whole lot louder. Gotcha. Size of the box. <laughs> I, I don't think I understand what just Okay. Because I mean, I get the math, like the kind of the math, but like. So here's the leap that I was hoping that I was trying to get you to make. Okay, I'm saying enclosed resonant space, which is a term I never used in class. Okay. But yes, and when I say enclosed resonant space, that is, you can also describe that as a pipe that is closed at both ends. That is an enclosed okay. resonant space. Okay. Okay. That's the leap. So if you translate enclosed resonant space into pipe closed at both ends, then at that point, it becomes fairly straightforward. So now, whatever frequency is, is going to have a wavelength that's twice that long. And therefore, we know the frequency has a wavelength of 2.1 feet. And therefore, the pipe must be half that long, which would be 1.05 feet. Oh, because, because if we were doing it the other way, we would be doubling. Right. Okay. Yep. So we're just coming at this backwards and using words that I hadn't used before. Okay. And I'm just trying to see if you can make that leap a little bit. OK. If a comb filter had its first reinforcement at 3.6 kilohertz, what frequency would its first cancellation occur at? OK, so first reinforcement is 3,600 hertz. How would I find time? Because I would need to, I, you know, in order to find the cancellation, I first need to know the amount of time that it took to do that. If we, let's go back and look that up. For the, if, OK, let's just look these formulas up real quick to remind ourselves. Oops. OK, so here is solving for a reinforcement frequency. T equals I plus 1 divided by frequency I. OK, let me just do this so we can see a little bit better what we're doing. OK. Um, so t is going to equal i, and in, in this case, i is 0 because we're dealing with the first reinforcement. So it's going to be 0 plus 1 divided by the frequency, 3,600. Yes, so this would be just 1 divided by 3,600. And what would that be? Yeah. In seconds. In seconds. So uh, in scientific innovation, that's 2.777 to the negative 4, right? So that, if we, oops, translate that out. It's 0. Point, say it again, how many zeros? Three zeros. Zero, zero, two, seven, eight. OK. So that is seconds, right? There's my t. t equals that. OK, so now I want to know the first cancellation. First cancellation is this guy over here. So uh, 2 times i plus 1 divided by 2 times t. So it would be 2 times, and i 
which is in this case is 0, because we're talking about first cancellation, plus 1 divided by 2 times this number. Yes? So 2 times 0 is 0. So now we're really looking just at 1 divided by 2 times 0 0.000278. Um, so let's see if we can work on that. So here's that number. I'm going to first multiply that by 2. Get that. I'll pop that into my pcalc memory. And then I'll just say 1 divided by that number. I get 1,800 hertz. Is that what you guys got? Yep. 1,800 hertz. Can I see that formula again so I can write it down and get it the last time in the Okay, so um, the next question is what difference in distance would that represent? So we figured out time, right? So we just need to convert that time to distance. So if I, if I pull this back in, Divide it back by 2 again. So there's the actual time in seconds. And I want to know what distance that is. Well, the first thing I would want to do personally is I would want to convert that to milliseconds, OK? <laughs> because that's a whole lot easier to deal with. So uh, what would I do to get this from seconds to milliseconds? Divide by a thousand, right? Because it's a thousand milliseconds in a second, and I got two point, you know, you know zero point zero 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 two seven. So, divide this by one thousand. Okay, and now I can multiply that by what? One point one three feet. Yeah, one point one three feet per milliseconds. So here's here's the rule of thumb. You're, when you're doing these conversions between milliseconds and feet, the value in milliseconds, or time, is always going to be smaller than the value in distance. OK? <coughs> so if I'm starting with time, and I want to know distance, am I looking for a bigger number or a smaller number? A bigger, a bigger number, right? So in this case, I want to multiply this by 1.13. And that'll give me a bigger number. If I divided by 1.13, I'd get a smaller number. But I don't want a smaller number. I want a bigger number because I'm trying to get distance. If I was trying to get time, I would divide. Okay, So if I multiply this by 1.13, I get that, which is. I don't know. I need to turn off the scientific um, notation yeah, here. I, I need. I'll go back to the regular pcalc that doesn't do this. Now. Yeah, it's it's a lot of zeros. Let me go back here. I'll do it here because I think I have that turned off here. Let me make sure. This will help a little bit. So, yeah. Okay. So let's just run this again real quick. So um, so we, we've got t already, so that would be 0 0.000278 seconds. And I want to convert that to milliseconds. Yeah, I think I divided before, didn't I? So times 1,000. Yeah, this will make more sense. OK, so 0.278 milliseconds. And now I'm going to multiply that by 1.13 feet. That makes more sense. Okay, so it's actually 0.31414 feet. Okay. Sorry, I, I, I did that one step wrong. Okay, so if you got somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.31414 feet, you got it right. If you didn't, write down the math 
and then you'll have it right. OK, uh, next thing, resonant frequency of a 1.32 foot pipe closed at one end. OK, so again, pipe closed at one end, 1.32 feet. This magic frequency is going to have a wavelength that is larger than 1.32 feet, right? How much larger? Four times. So what is four times 1.32? times 4, 5.28. Yes? yes? All right, Laura got it. So 5.28. And uh, I'll just say remember that for a moment. And now I want to find out the frequency, right? And that would be 1,130 feet per second divided by that number. So 1130 zero, zero, divided by whatever that number was, 5.28. And I get 214 hertz or so, right? So if you were in that neighborhood, you got it. OK, so now we're going we're to do the same problem backwards. So I'm going to give you the frequency, and I want you to tell me how long the pipe would be. So now we have it's 360 hertz. And I want to know what size of closed at one end pipe what I need to resonate that frequency. So this is what we did with the demonstration on Friday with the, where I had the tuning fork and everything. Uh, so I know it's 360 hertz. I would first need to know the wavelength of 360 hertz before I could know how long the pipe would need to be. So 360 hertz wavelength would be speed of sound, 1,130 feet per second, divided by 360. Oops. Three, six, zero. I get 3.1389. OK? So there's my wavelength. Now, this, if I want to make a closed at one end pipe resonate that, that pipe is not going to be 3.138 feet, right? It's going to be shorter than that. How much shorter? It's going to be a fourth shorter, right? So I need to divide this number by 4. Divide by 4. I get 0 0.78472 feet. That's the length of the pipe. So a, a pipe closed at one end that's 0 0.78472 feet will resonate 360 hertz. So if you got somewhere in the half a foot range or so, you got it right. OK, back to comb filtering. We're almost done with page four. Are we going to make it? We're getting there. What delay between two signals of equal level would account for a comb filter with the first reinforcement at 623 hertz? OK, well, here it is. Solve for, I, I'm looking for t here, right? Looking for time. Solve for t using reinforcement frequency. t equals i plus 1 divided by the frequency. So. First reinforcement would be i of 0, so 0 plus 1 divided by the frequency, which is 623. And here we go. 1 divided by 623. Why is this not working? 0 0.00161. OK, so now that's seconds. I, want, I, I ideally, I mean, you could do that in seconds and you'd have it right. But usually I, I like to see these in milliseconds, so I would convert that to milliseconds by doing what? Times 1,000. OK, so if you got somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half milliseconds, then you're right. Or 0 0.006 milliseconds, OK? No, zero, one, zero, zero, one, six milliseconds. Um, so the on the bottom of that equation where it has that it's the fi mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we need to fi is is the frequency. Okay. So it's the frequency for that given scenario. Okay. For that okay. given okay. i integer. That's, okay. I yeah. that was confusing me because I yeah. thought it was like. 
So remember, I is just, in this case, stands in for zero. And frequency zero in this case is 623 hertz. Right, I, but I was confused because if it was like two or yeah. four, I was like, no, 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 no. I would have multiplied yeah. that and then gone like a really long distance. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to do that. Okay, um, this particular equation was, was designed by the, the, my co-writer of my book, and, and she's a computer scientist. So she was writing this in a way that would make sense for a computer. And computers really like <laughs> integer variables that change all the time. So this would make perfect sense to a computer. But you have to think twice about it when you look at it as a human being, because it's like, oh, wait a minute. No, that means something different than I would right. intuitively think it would mean. But that's why. Uh, OK. So let's do cancellation now. What delay of two signals of equal level would account for a comb filter with a second cancellation occurring at 3.53 kilohertz? OK, so somewhere in here I did solving for cancellation, which is this one. OK, so solving T for a cancellation. So it's going to be 2 times i. What would i be in this case? If it's second cancellation, i would be 1. OK, so 2 times 1 plus 1 divided by 2 times frequency i, in this case frequency 1, which is 3.53 kilohertz, so 3530 hertz. Okay. And let's see if we can figure out what that looks like. So 2 times 3530, 7060. And 2 times 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3. I can do that in my head. So 3 divided by whatever that number was, 7060 equals, I thought I had that turned off. There we go. Point zero 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 four two five seconds. OK. In milliseconds, that would be times 1,000. 0.42. Milliseconds. Yeah. Let me try that again. Wait. Three divided by seven thousand sixty. Yeah, point zero 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 four two. Maybe it's just because it's calculated. Times one thousand. I get point four two milliseconds. Okay, so if you got somewhere in the half a millisecond range, you're right. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry, why did you do times a thousand? Just to get it into milliseconds. Oh. Because it was seconds, oh. and I just like to see things in mill. That's just it. Either is right. Okay. I just personally I like milliseconds because I can visualize how, I can how, visualize milliseconds better than I can visualize seconds. How did you know to do times a thousand? Because it's a thousand milliseconds in a second. All right, wavelength of 4.3 kilohertz. This should be easy by now. 1,130 feet per second divided by 4,300. There we go. 1, 1, 3, 0 divided by 4, 3, 0, 0. We get 0.26 feet. All right, so if you got somewhere around 0.26 feet, you got it right. You got it right, look at that. OK, we're getting there. We're almost done. I think we'll make it. Maybe. OK, uh, three lowest frequency, resonant frequencies in a room of these dimensions. OK, so we're looking for 
wavelengths that are twice as long as each of these, right? Because we're talking about parallel walls, pipes closed at both ends. So that's the first thing I want to do is multiply all these things by 2. So 15 foot 6 inches would just be 15.5 feet, right? So 15.5 times 2 is 31. Yes? We got that? So uh, now I just figure out what frequency that would be for that wavelength, which is 1,130 feet per second divided by 31 gives me 36 and a half hertz. Okay, so 36.45 hertz is the first one. Now, uh, 10 foot 4 inches would be, how would we express that in feet? Probably like 10.33 something, yep. right? 10.33333. And how, how would you do that if you can't just like pull that out of your butt? Well, I'm just saying, so it's there's 12 inches in a foot. 12 divided by 4 is... Oh, so you would yeah. just do like the other part? Like yeah, you could go back and do all those extra well, steps, I mean, right? because the 10 feet is already feet. So yeah. you would just need to know... Just figure out the 4 inches. The 4 factors yeah. into yeah. that? Yeah. Okay, and then I'm I'm like I'm losing you on. Can you just like for this for this one? Can you just I don't I don't know what's happening. I'm very confused. So, so we're talking about resonance pipe closed to both ends. Right. Okay. So I've got I've got a distance of ten point three three feet. Okay. And I'm looking for a wavelength that's twice that long. Okay. Right? Because it's closed at both ends pipe. Right. right? So I'm just going to multiply that by two. I got twenty point six six six. That's my wavelength. So I get a frequency from a wavelength by doing 1,130 feet per second divided by that wavelength, and I get 54.67 hertz. And then we do the exact same thing all over again for 8 feet. So now it's going to be a 16-foot wavelength, right? We can do that in our head. 8 times 2 is 16. So 1,130 feet per second divided by 8, no, 16, 70.625 hertz. Those are the three lowest resonant frequencies of that sort of room. You could, you'll create standing waves of those frequencies in this room. Um, I think the only thing I'm confused about is, like, in the equation, mm -hmm. what part of the equation does that number represent? Is it the frequency? Like, is what it number? The, the, the distance. Like, the one, like, the... the, the it's the size of the pipe. Okay. The size of the pipe that's close to both ends. Okay, uh, I don't know that we'll get all of these frequencies, but we'll give it a good try here. Um, so, case of two singers in a musical, both wearing wireless microphones, calculate the first three cancellations, then three reinforcements. That will happen when they stand eight inches apart, okay? So first we need to have that eight inches in seconds, right? So let's first convert it to feet. Eight inches is how many feet? We learned how to do this a minute ago. We just divide it by 12, right? Eight divided by 12 gives us 0.6667 feet. And I want that in milliseconds first, and then I can get it into seconds. So we're just jumping around here. but So 0.667 feet, what would that be in milliseconds? I would have to, I want, if I want time, do I multiply or divide by 1.13? Divide. Divide, because you want a smaller number, right? So we will divide by 1.13. Oops. 1.13. I get 0.58 milliseconds. And what would that be in seconds? I would have to divide this by 1,000, right? Like half a second. Okay. It is. It's half a second. So, or half a millisecond. 
Oh, yeah, we do, is this in milliseconds or seconds? This is half, this is milliseconds right now. Oh, okay. All right, so in seconds, we divide that by 1,000. And we get 0 0.00589975, okay? That's T. So now we found T for this equation here. Okay, so now we should be able to sort this out. So I'll do cancellations. So this will be cancellation 0, 1, and 2. And so cancellation is going to be 2 times 0 plus 1 divided by 2 times t, and t I've remembered. So 2 times 0 is 0. Uh, so it's 1 divided by 2 times t. So here is t. Multiply that by 2. And uh, I should have actually a 1 divided by x button on here, but let's see it. Oh, doesn't matter. OK, uh, so I'll just put that in my memory now and say 1 divided by that number, 847.5 hertz. OK, and oops. And then we just repeat that now for the, for the other values. So uh, 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3, right? So we just do 3 divided by that number, and we get 2542.5, OK, we'll keep going here. This one will be 2 times 2 plus 1. So that would be 5 divided by this number. 4, oops. 2, 3, 7.5. Okay, those are my first cancellations. Do the same thing for reinforcements. So 0, 1, 2 reinforcements is going to be uh, 0 plus 1 divided by t. So let's see, uh, I'm going to get that number. I'll divide it by 2 again. So we'll get where I had before. Put that in my memory. And now we can just do 1 divided by that number is 1,695 hertz. Next one is going to be uh, 1 plus 1 divided by t. So that's 2 divided by my number. It's 3,390 hertz. Next is going to be. 2 plus 1 divided by t, so now it's 3. 3 divided by my t value, and I get 5,085 hertz. Whew. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, we got five more minutes, and I got one more page. <laughs> so jot that down if you didn't, if you didn't get it right. Everybody got the right answer written down now? Oh, yes. I, I'm, I'm like having right. <laughs> Write it down, hurry, write it down. I, I, it's not going to make any sense. <laughs> I do, I... All I'm doing is these two formulas over and over and over again. And I'm just changing the value of i. I go 0, if i is 0, i is 1, i is 2. And you just do it over and over and over again. OK, did anybody get these last ones? Did anyone go to the Catawba and measure it? Um, Jason did. I had, yeah, I have the uh, numbers. Oh, good. No, that's where you get the numbers from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I made them up. Oh, I just, yeah, I just went into the archive and was like, oh, hey, here's the You show just measured it in the CAD yeah. file? Yeah. So what are, the, what are the distances we're dealing with? Uh, so for Catawba, your x is 67 feet. Your y is 58.83 feet, and your z for height is 32 feet. OK. So there you go. Uh, times those all by 2, and, f and then figure out your resonant frequencies. 36.2? 32. 32. 
32 feet, 58.3 feet, and 67 feet. So multiply those by two, and you'll have the wavelength of those resonant frequencies. And then you could find frequency from wavelength. I won't take you through that right now, but uh, that's the gist of that one. The Friedman Theater, and did anybody figure out? Yeah, that one is <laughs> so how, uh, 81 foot um, distance. So it's approximately 81 feet from between the, the upstage wall of the theater and the mix position. Yep. Yeah, so you just, it, it, remember, if we've got feet and we want time, time is going to be a smaller number, right? So we want to divide it by 1.13. So 81 divided by 1.13. 81 divided by 1.13. Yeah, that's right. 71.68 milliseconds. And thus endeth the wave propagation homework. <laughs> Sorry, we, would have, we wouldn't have had to rush on those last two so much if I hadn't run out of time on the Friday and had to do those last two slides. OK, so um, here's, the, here's the takeaway, OK? Whether or not you can do all of this math on the fly without ever looking anything up is not particularly important to me. What is important to me is that you could do the math if you looked some things up and figured it out, right? The other part of it is that you understand that there are a couple of things that are important. First of all, the size of things in which sound propagates affects the way it propagates relative to its wavelength, OK? So sound ha sounds that you hear have a size, a physical size that exists in space. And the size of the thing in which that is happening affects it, OK? Size of the room affects the sound relative to the size of the sound, OK? That's important. Uh, there is a relationship between the speed of sound and its size, OK? That's important to understand. So the, the size of the, of the wavelength, or its size, its frequency, and the speed of sound are connected inseparably. That is a closed loop, OK? You can't change one without the other changing can't change the speed of sound without both the, the wavelength and the frequency changing. Can't change the frequency without the wavelength or the speed of sound changing. Right? One of them has to change in order for that to give. Okay? Uh, the other thing I want you to understand is that when sounds run into each other at a different time, the same sound runs into each other at a different time, bad things happen. Right? It's called comb filtering. We can calculate it. We can look that up and calculate it. But the important thing that you know is if you have two instances of the same sound that arrive at a listener or get mixed together on a wire or otherwise run into each other, and that happen they run into each other at a different time, they will destroy each other in some way, shape, or form. That, and they will destroy each other by canceling frequencies out, reinforcing others. Okay, Those are the takeaways from this. Now what will happen on Friday? is we're going to start now talking about uh, amplitude, basically. Okay, We haven't spent a whole lot of time on amplitude. We'll start now. We'll get into amplitude and how we measure that. How do we measure the amplitude of things? And as we know, amplitude usually get, translates into loudness. How loud is it perceived? And how do you measure that? And what are all the variables that impact amplitude? Okay, uh, And we usually measure it using this unit of measurement that sound people invented called decibels. Okay? So we'll learn about this unit of measurement that we invented called decibels. All right, that'll be Friday. So hand me your little pieces of paper. I will do my best not to lose them. <laughs> if you don't, if you didn't staple it, please write your name on each one, just real quick, just in case, because I am notorious for this is a very dangerous thing that I'm asking you to do, which is hand me paper. I do not. I am really bad with paper. That was me in high school. 90% of my, the reason I wouldn't pass it by was like, well, I didn't turn into the assignments. I had to go dig through my pile of paper in my backpack. Yeah. Oh, I better stop my video here. Hang on. OK.